ערב טוב, אנחנו בעצם מנהלים את הערב בשפה האנגלית, אז אני עובר מיד לאנגלית. I'd like to welcome you to the second of the Distinguished George Mosser Jerusalem Lecture Series. If some of you remember, the first was delivered by Professor Jan Asman here at the Van Leer Institute in December 2004. And like all these lectures, um, we publish the lectures after they've been given. And the first, his has been published already under the title of God and Gods, Egypt, Israel, and the Rise of Monotheism. The Mosse program, which is endowed by and named after the famed and much-loved George Mosse, who also shared his time between Madison and Jerusalem, the idea of the program is an exchange between Madison and Jerusalem on numerous levels. Uh, the level of student exchanges, where students from Israel and Madison come to visit Jerusalem or Madison. There are some of its graduates are sitting here now, and which provides an absolutely rare opportunity um, for Israeli students especially. Uh, there are also um, conferences, faculty visits, workshops, publications, all of this has been in operation for close to a decade now, and the present lecture series forms an important part of its myriad activities, and it's one in which we are fortunate enough to bring some of the world's leading scholars to Jerusalem for an extended period. Uh, but before I introduce our speaker, let me just acknowledge and thank Mr. Arik Dubnov, who is sitting in the back there, the last row, the administrative director of the program, for all his selfless work and the many hours he's put in in organizing this event. Uh, without him, this would not have been possible. Yashar Koach. Now, I suppose I have to employ the self-contradicting cliché that Professor Michael Maris needs no introduction. Well, if he needs no introduction, why give this introduction? Uh, that's one of the paradoxes here. Um, it's not only his important work that is known to us in Jerusalem. The bond is much more personal for he and his lovely wife, Carol, who is somewhere in the audience. There she is. Um, have spent extended periods in our city, most famously in our Institute of Advanced Studies, um, where I think it was more or less a year that they were here. I first remember meeting Michael in 1984 in the library at Givat Ram and was rather awed having some years earlier read his 1971 pioneering work in Jewish history, The Politics of Assimilation, a study of the French Jewish community at the time of the Dreyfus Affair. Over time, although the awe has remained, we became close friends and so the pleasure of welcoming him and Carol is made even greater. Michael hides many of his great achievements under very modest exterior. He is not only a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, but very recently has been made a member of the Order of Canada. Nothing less, I have been told, than the Canadian version of knighthood. He has strongly advised me, however, that we cannot call him Sir Michael. Michael is the Chancellor Rose and Ray Wolf Professor Emeritus of Holocaust Studies at the University of Toronto and a Senior Fellow of Massey College. I've just spent time there and if you compare the architecture of Massey College to the catastrophe that is Mount Scopus, we'll see what a campus should look like. That is not a, that's not in my text, that's just a spontaneous addition. Michael is the author of various pioneering and prize-winning works. I'll just include a few here. Together with Robert Paxton, he wrote the enormously influential Vichy France and the Jews. He's written an important study on European refugees in the 20th century entitled The Unwanted, an analysis of the Nuremberg Trials, 1945-46, and a classic that has emerged from his stay in Jerusalem entitled The Holocaust in History. Let me just say that all of these works are characterized by a clarity 
and liberal judiciousness that is the envy of all who read them. Perhaps even more extraordinarily, Michael has recently obtained a Master of Studies in Law. How many of us in our mature years have got the courage and the desire to be retrained in an entirely other field? I think it can count it on the fingers of one hand. For the next few evenings, we will hear the fruits of his immersion in the fields of both history and law, and will be fascinated, I am sure, by his exploration of the relationship and possible tensions between history and law. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Michael Maris. Steve, thank you for that very kind introduction. I am so, so pleased to be here with you. I am really moved to be in Jerusalem uh, to experience extraordinary architecture, may I say, in this, in this uh, wonderful city, uh, to be at the Van Leer Institute. I am touched as well to see so many friends, old friends, uh, and I am, uh, I am very moved by uh, your introduction and by your reference to our our long-standing association. Uh, Steve, I'm, I'm very touched to be your guest here this evening. You approached me uh, many years ago about uh, giving so these lectures, and I promptly uh, put this out of my mind. And then the time came closer, and I realized uh, I, had, I had to get to work. I had to get to work, uh, and let me add to uh, the Van Leer, Jerusalem, Ashheim, friends, uh, I am especially touched and honored that these lectures are in the name of George Mossy. Uh, George Mossy, uh, for those of you who did not know him, uh, was a wonderful man. Uh, I don't have to say this for those who were his friends, his students, his associates, his colleagues. I suspect that there, is, uh, there are all of these things here. But uh, George had a special capacity to connect with people, all kinds of people, uh, and to absorb one's attention. If I may just, before I begin, I have to share an anecdote uh, with you. I remember inviting George Mossy to the University of Toronto and picking him up at the airport. I never pick it, people up at the airport. I don't pick Steve Ashheim up at the airport. I pick... But I picked George up at the airport. I had a little sports car at the time, and we drove off into the night, and we began immediately to talk. Time passed. Time passed. <laughs> Where was Toronto? I realized that I'd gone in exactly the opposite direction. <laughs> so absorbed uh, was I with my conversation with George Mossy. Ladies and gentlemen, good friends, uh, what I'm going to speak to you uh, about, and I hope to have a conversation with you, especially in the second and third lectures, uh, is somewhat controversial, I acknowledge. And I have to say, from time to time, I asked myself, what would George think? What would George think? I have no idea what George would think, I have to say, but I want to tell you that uh, the book that I have written is, I think, better for my having constantly in mind what would George think. He had the highest standards. He had a wonderfully critical mind. He had great breadth of knowledge and experience. And as a mentor and as a friend, uh, I can't claim to have been a student of his as Steve was, uh, but I have to say he made all of our work better, I believe. And so, Steve, I am especially honored and pleased to convey to the committee my sense of appreciation for being here this evening, not only among friends, not only in this institute, not only in this wonderful city, but also as the George Mossy Lecturer. Spit at it, wrote Leon Wieseltier, a sophisticated Jewish writer not known for extreme views, spit at it, he wrote, advising his mother, a Holocaust survivor, about how to respond to a query 
about possible restitution payments for wartime wrongs committed against Jews. Apparently, Wieseltier's mother needed no persuasion. At issue, it is now clear from his November 1999 article on the subject in the New Republic, at issue was not so much the alleged insufficiency of the proposed payment from the Swiss, but also, as often in the sometimes heated discourse on the subject, the principle of the matter. Now, this series of lectures that I uh, am to deliver has to do with that principle, and indeed with the various principles that were held to be at stake in the Holocaust restitution campaign of the 1990s in the United States, beginning with the affair of the Swiss banks and extending to German industry for forced and slave labor, and going on to insurance and art, all together leading to settlements in the neighborhood of eight billion American dollars. These settlements have been the object of much controversy, and there is a wide range of legitimate views on this subject, and it is somewhat controversial. The whole subject, according to Stuart Eisenstadt, one of the participants, uh, in uh, this matter is politically radioactive. The context is a torrent of analyses of human rights, historical memory, memory politics, apologies, restitution, writings on all of these issues having to do ultimately with how to deal with historic wrongs the reparation of historic wrongs. Increasingly these writings drew new attention to the victims of great persecutions and crimes against humanity and how we contend with grievances long after the events themselves. Restitution is in the air, writes one observer. And so I want to underscore that what I have to say does not just deal at all with the Holocaust. Ultimately, the subject is addressing and writing historic wrongs. Specifically, though, on this campaign, which I'm going to be speaking about, I think a consensus emerged in the end that the results were imperfect, but that they achieved, and this is the title of the book that will come from these uh, lectures, some measure of justice, a phrase that highlights both a sense of insufficiency as well as achievement. Now, some measure of justice. My goal is to assess what is meant by justice in these cases and to evaluate just what was achieved and what was not achieved. Put otherwise, in this and the lectures that follow, I will try to make sense of this most recent wave of justice seeking for the Holocaust. What it has been, what, why it emerged when it did, how it fits with earlier reparation to the Jewish people for the Holocaust, how its, uh, its implications for, historic, for the historical representation of the Holocaust, and finally, what its implications are in the wider project of justice seeking in our time. I also stress that I take this issue up as a historian first and foremost, but also as a historian preoccupied with claims of historical justice that set this campaign in motion and with the larger question of what happens to historical understanding and historical interpretation when it enters the legal arena. So let me begin. And for the most part, this evening, I want to lay out what this restitution campaign was all about, and then I will, uh, in the two subsequent lectures, uh, analyze it in more detail. Restitution in the 1990s. Uh, 
The restitution agreements discussed in these lectures may be likened to the laws in the famous quip attributed to Otto von Bismarck, the 19th century Iron Chancellor of Imperial Germany. As Bismarck is supposed to have said, laws are like sausages. It's best not to see them in the making. In the remainder of this lecture, I want to take a look at these various restitution efforts and to indicate why, in my view at least, they were unmistakably sausage-like. In the following two lectures, I will attempt to situate this campaign in its own historical context and then offer some critique of the issues from both a legal and a historical perspective. So let me take now a few minutes to describe the different parts of this campaign so that you'll know what I'm talking about. Beginning with the Swiss banks. The engine of the Holocaust restitution campaign launched in 1996 and concluded three years later with a settlement of $1.25 billion was the largest settlement of a human rights issue to that point in the United States and I believe uh, anywhere. The issue began with a focus on dormant accounts leading to class action lawsuits filed in federal court in Brooklyn involving more than two dozen different law firms against three major Swiss banks, the Credit Suisse, the Union Bank of Switzerland, and the Swiss Bank Corporation, claiming tens of millions of dollars in damages and restitution. Pressure against the Swiss was orchestrated by Edgar Bronfman and Israel Singer at the World Jewish Congress and with the powerful assistance of political leaders. Republican Senator Alphonse D'Amato from New York, who was chairman of the Senate Banking Committee, Alan Hevesy, who was the controller of the city of New York, the press, and also the Clinton administration. Over the course of the next months, pressure also came from Congress, the media, and threats of sanctions against the Swiss. Accusations widened, including not only wartime robberies, but also the subsequent cover-up. Stuart Eisenstadt, a senior State Department official who had worked on restitution matters since 1995, became deeply involved in these negotiations at the request of the Clinton administration, a sign of the American government's commitment to resolving this and subsequent restitution issues. Eisenstadt directed a massive investigation that culminated in his 1997 report detailing how Nazi Germany looted some $4 billion worth of gold from the central banks of countries that it overran. This included gold from individual victims in the form of gold teeth and jewelry, which Germany resmelted and transferred to Swiss banks, that's the Swiss connection, for conversion into hard currency. His second report, published in June 1998, chronicled how neutral nations provided the Nazis with crucial raw materials and minerals in exchange for Swiss francs. Eventually, out of all of this came the $1.25 billion settlement, worked out by Judge Edward Corman in August 1998, with five categories of claims. First was a deposit assets class, this is the largest, made up of those who had unresolved Swiss bank accounts, those or their heirs who had unresolved Swiss bank accounts, and to which the bulk of the money would go. There was, but there was also a slave labor class one, made up of those who were forced to work for German companies and whose profits were sheltered in Switzerland. There was a slave labor class two, made up of those who were forced to work for Swiss-controlled companies in Germany. There was a refugee class, made up of those who had been mistreated as refugees by Switzerland, attempting to get into Switzerland without success. And a looted assets class, made up of those whose property was looted by the Nazis and disposed of by Swiss institutions. From each of these classes, there were claimants 
who participated, who were beneficiaries of the $1.25 billion settlement. I want to stress now that there was never any legal finding on the substance of this issue. That is, there was no finding by the federal court in New York that the Swiss were legally obliged, legally responsible. Rather, the matter was resolved, as virtually all class action settlements, uh, as uh, class action suits are resolved, through a settlement. I'll be returning to that. That's the first. The second is the slave and forced labor issue. This has to do with the employment, often under duress and in terrible conditions, of as many as 12 million Europeans. This was one of, one of the fundamental policies of the Third Reich, that is to impress these millions of people to work for uh, the Reich, and it was an essential requirement of its war-making and imperial strategy during the Second World War. This has been referred to as the largest use of foreign labor since the end of slavery in the 19th century. Some 80%, this is a point often not uh, noted, some 80% of the claimants in this slave and forced labor set of suits were non-Jews. Although the moral validity of the claims was widely accepted, I should say, and accepted by the uh, defendants as well as, as, uh, as, as, of course, pressed by the claimants, there had never been compensation for the illegal employment of civilians during the Second World War, and for two basic reasons. The first was because such compensation was considered a reparations issue after the Second World War, and these had never been part of the post-war agreements between Germany or West Germany and the victorious allies. There had never been any agreement on these reparations at the end of World War II. And the second reason was because Germany refused, with the agreement of the Western powers, I should say, led by the United States, Germany refused to pay billions of dollars to most, to the largest number of people used for such slave and forced labor, namely Eastern Europeans, who were living in the Soviet Union or Soviet-dominated countries. Related to this uh, in the view was, the, was the unwillingness uh, of West Germany to shoulder the entire burden of such compensation given uh, East Germany's unwillingness to pay any compensation whatever. So this issue, which had been dormant, if you like, since the end of the uh, Second World War, notwithstanding the fact that there were a few individuals who pressed this case, but internationally this was, uh, this was dormant. I'm referring to Benjamin Ferenz, of course, who was one of the activists in this score, but, but the issue remained largely dormant until the end of the Cold War. And with the end of the Cold War, and with the, and I'll describe this more uh, in the next lecture, but also with the momentum provided by the Swiss banks case, and this is extremely important. There was a great legal momentum uh, built up in the United States, uh, prompting lawyers to undertake on their own initiative lawsuits uh, this campaign uh, for uh, restitution on the basis of slave and forced labor began powerfully in the United States. Beginning in March 1998, with a spectacular lawsuit against the American automotive giant Ford, and its German subsidiary. Lawyers went to court in five different states, from New York to California, to win compensation and damages for the use of their clients' wartime labor. In addition to the American companies Ford, and also General Motors, the defendants soon included familiar pillars of German industry. Simmons, 
Daimler-Benz, Volkswagen, Degussa, Hugo Boss, Bayer, Hurst, and, and, and so on. Unlike the case with the Swiss banks, both the claimants and the defendants came to the table together and came with their governments. Negotiations began in early 1999, and in addition to the litigants and victim groups involved no fewer than eight different governments, those of Germany, the United States, Israel, the Czech Republic, Poland, Russia, Belarus, uh, uh, and Ukraine. After close to a year of arduous deliberations, the logic of settlement prevailed, as it always does in such cases, and the agreement reached with German industry at the end of 1999 amounted to some 10 billion Deutschmark and was uh, made uh, and, and uh, was, was uh, presented to, um, to, to all concerned. This uh, important settlement involved the distinction between two classes of plaintiffs, a smaller class the slave labor class, made up mainly of Jews who had toiled in concentration camps and who were intended to be worked to death, and secondly, a much larger class of forced laborers, mostly Slavic people who had worked elsewhere for the German war machine under a wide variety of conditions ranging from the most cruel to relatively favorable. And there was differential payment uh, for each uh, uh, class. Both the German government and the German industry contributed to this settlement and a German foundation known as Remembrance Responsibility and the Future was established in order to discharge the agreement. That's the second. And now the third, insurance. The, the insurance was much more complicated. The core of the claims against the insurance companies' concern was that these European companies, not just German companies, I should say, these company, insurance companies owed millions and millions of dollars that had never been paid to Holocaust victims or their heirs. These were claims made on behalf of Holocaust victims or their heirs who had such uh, insurance policies in the pre-war and wartime period. Now, they were much more complicated claims, as I've said, uh, partly because, well, for details that I'm going to be going into in order to show some of the problematic dimensions of this claim, but um, suffice it to say that when viewed in general terms, um, it was extremely difficult to pin down to specific defendants or to connect specific defendants with uh, specific insurance companies. Nevertheless, uh, the, the uh, negotiations proceeded, though with great difficulty, and in August 1998, six major European insurers reached agreement with the U.S. insurance regulators to, and the Claims Conference and, and the World Jewish Restitution Organization and the Israelis to establish a International Commission on Holocaust-Era Insurance Claims. That's I-C-H-E-I-C, -E known as ICHEC, this acronym that applied, for this co uh, applied to this commission that would oversee the negotiating of a settlement. ICHEC, interestingly, rejected the rough justice of the labor settlement in favor of a very laborious effort to determine how much was owed to each and every claimant. This involved very difficult negotiations because often uh, people were working without complete I information to say the very least and so often uh, the insurance companies uh, that had been in existence uh, in the pre-war period and subsequently were no longer in existence or were difficult to connect to present-day insurance companies at, uh, at, to, at the time. But, but nevertheless, there was eventually a settlement. And 
uh, iCheck noted that among those who received payments in, in their report summing up this whole process, there were 8,000 claimants who had not been able even to name a specific insurance company. And in addition, uh, the, uh, well, altogether, the payments were over $306 million, uh, $30 million of which were designated for East European claimants in cases where policies had been written by companies that had been nationalized or liquidated at the end of the war and for which no present-day successor could be identified. And then there were cases that involved only anecdotal information. Some 31,000 persons received humanitarian awards totaling $31 million, and there was $169 million to various humanitarian programs for Holocaust survivors supporting welfare, health, services, and other social programs. So, art aside, those are the, um, the major uh, classes of restitution agreements. Now, before turning to art, let me say something about what all of these had in common. And now I'm generalizing about all three kinds of restitution campaigns from the American campaign of the 1990s. The critical element, and this is going to involve uh, a good deal of my analysis, the critical element of context in all of these cases is a very particular legal culture in the United States, very highly developed, and it is the high stakes class action litigation. This is a kind of uh, legal activity, civil suits, that reached its height, you've heard of this, with the uh, campaigns against the tobacco companies in uh, the 1990s, or with asbestos companies, uh, or with companies that were held to be responsible for widespread pollution. The essence of this kind of lawsuit is that a large group of people, a very large group of people, sometimes involving thousands and tens of thousands and even more people, are assembled by lawyers in order to bring a case before the court. Let me say something about the culture of these class action lawsuits. And I draw liberally as I do so from one of the lawyers for the claimants, a man named Morris Ratner, who wrote an article in a legal journal which is a kind of manual of how to do it. It is, Ratner admits, heavily driven by the way that the lawyers are paid for these lawsuits. As you can imagine, assembling tens of thousands of people to bring cases before the courts and conforming to very precise legal requirements, the rules of how these cases must be brought before the courts, is extraordinarily expensive. And the way that lawyers do this class action work is through contingency fees, by which lawyers are paid only when there is a favorable outcome. And they are paid by an agreed percentage of the settlement, which must be approved by the court, which determines that such payments are fair and just. With lawyers' fees structured in this way, this means that attorneys' already robust competitive urges to win are often fueled by economic necessity. And in some cases, it must, must be said, by the attraction of huge earnings in the event of gigantic settlements. Lawyers pursuing human rights or individual class action cases on a contingency basis cannot afford to select the wrong cases or to posture those cases in an unfavorable manner, Ratner candidly 
indicates. Put more bluntly, aggression is practically built into this system. And this is why this kind of litigation is so intensely controversial in the United States, and you can find strong partisans in favor of this system and opposed to it, as is the current uh, American ad administration. But I don't want to go too far down that road. I do want to add, however, that selecting the defendants, and this will be a theme that, on which I will be elaborating, selecting which companies you go after does not derive from a careful weighing of historical responsibility, the way we assume historians uh, conduct themselves, but rather by an evaluation of the likely legal outcome. Facing countless legal hurdles, and I don't want to underestimate these, this is not an easy uh, task for the lawyers concerned, they must identify defendants over whom the court will accept jurisdiction and who will ultimately make, the worthwhile, make worthwhile a huge investment of expensive legal talent, time, and money. It's important to stress, too, as one enters into the world of these uh, class action lawsuits, that the plaintiffs, that is the claimants, usually see themselves as underdogs. And certainly Morris Ratner did in this article to which I refer. There is a danger in the victim's advocates being too timid, he writes, and failing to creatively use the, legal, the judicial system to obtain justice, even in tough cases. They have to apply maximum pressure through governments and through the media and through grassroots activism. That's how a lawyer put it. A political actor, I'm going to quote now Ellen Steinberg, Ellen Steinberg of the World Jewish Congress, he put it much more brutally, why did it work, he asked, because we beat their brains out. It's like Pharaoh, this is punishment. Stuart Eisenstadt, uh, not a lawyer, uh, but a diplomat, was much more critical of the lawyers. Here is Eisenstadt. The lawsuits, but he's very much on the side of the claimants, the lawsuits were simply a vehicle for a titanic political struggle, which was messy, sometimes unseemly, and constantly frustrating. The lawyers, Eisenstadt wrote, could be outrageous. He referred to their often infantile, ego-driven maneuvers, quarrels, manipulations, peppered with accusatory words like scandalous, double-crossed, poisonous, evil and worse, although he conceded that without these blandishments there would not have been a favorable settlement. Eisenstadt, I should say, saw the matter as a negotiator from which came his very critical reaction to the lawyers. The litigators, Eisenstadt writes, hijacked the Swiss bank dispute. They were a witch's brew of egos and mutual jealousies, greatly complicating my responsibility to keep the Swiss affair from careening out of diplomatic control and impeding my ability to develop a coherent bargaining unit with which the Swiss could deal. Now, Eisenstadt's preference, clearly, was, I mean, and everyone, this is like feeling the camel. Some people feel the leg of the camel, and others feel other parts of the camel. So Eisenstadt, feeling this camel as a diplomat, saw the diplomatic element as primary. His preference for resolving the disputes was diplomacy the value of which in his estimation was one of the major uh, lessons and one of the major uh, ways forward for these negotiations. But he saw the lawyers there as crucial, and he saw them very uh, critically. And then there was the World Jewish Congress, another player, neither diplomatic nor legal, but, if you like, pressing Jewish moral claims. Uh, Israel Singer, uh, 
at the right hand of Edgar Bronfman, the head of the World Jewish Congress, they were deeply suspicious of the lawyers. They weren't so uh, friendly to Stuart Eisenstadt either. And, uh, and, and, and they uh, had their own uh, perspective. I could go into a lot more detail, but uh, let me spare you uh, that, uh, uh, th those details. Uh, and let me now just step back a moment and look for just a few moments at so how some onlookers uh, observed uh, this uh, process at work. Um, to the wider community of litigators, and I include in this some of my colleagues um, with whom I am on very uh, friendly and close terms, but uh, these are academic lawyers who are basically appreciative, highly appreciative of this campaign and uh, who see in it, uh, who see it from a particular vantage point to many of them, and mostly I should say these are American legal academics, there is a message here which is relevant to this American legal culture which they celebrate, for which uh, they have a great deal of pride and satisfaction. Uh, here is one of the litigators but who speaks for this community, Bert Newborn, Professor Bert Newborn, who was a leading counsel for the plaintiffs, a distinguished professor at NYU, law professor. He looked on this Holocaust-era litigation campaign as a triumph of American justice. And he wrote about it as follows in this extraordinary passage uh, in an academic uh, collection. Measured by prosperity, freedom, innovation, tolerance, and the simultaneous achievement of social mobility and political stability, the American experiment is a remarkable success. It is so successful that no major economic player on the world stage can hope to succeed without participating vigorously in our market. This is written a few years ago and reaping the benefit of our economic prosperity. But that market and the resulting prosperity did not spring up by accident. Our success flows from a social and political commitment to fairness and the values of decency that find their expression in the American respect for the rule of law, a virtually unique legal system that provides a genuinely level playing field for a poor Holocaust survivor seeking to confront a corporate giant. In short, I believe that we are prosperous in large part because we have enjoyed and dispensed the blessings of equal justice under law and have built a legal system that provides the weak with a fair chance of victory at least sometimes. Now I want to say that this view, this celebration of American law, of course, had its powerful critics. And most of them came, almost all of them claim, came from overseas, from Europe, and from the world from which the defendants came. The Swiss, the uh, uh, Central Europeans, Germans, Austrians, and, and, and others. For these critics, particularly European critics, and coming, I might say, from a civil law rather than a common law system, which has its own uh, uh, important differences that, again, I'll be uh, elaborating on, what is particularly irksome is that none of the cases actually came to trial. None of them were resolved in court. They were all resolved through negotiations. Here is the late Gerald Feldman, uh, an American historian of Germany, as many of you know, and someone who worked for the Alliance, the largest insurance company involved in uh, these uh, ne uh, negotiations. The class action suit is unknown here in Germany, Feldman wrote, and the adversarial system employed in American civil law 
makes it possible for lawyers to make broad charges, insinuate all kinds of misbehavior, and present very shallow and even implausible arguments. Their purpose is to open up every conceivable area to discovery, that is, for the presentation of evidence to the court, and to force the opponent to disgorge information that will improve the plaintiff's case. Again, here I could elaborate, but simply, I think you get the point, there is a critique here of a Lex Americana. The notion that uh, an American system and a judge in Brooklyn, let us say, is presiding over intense negotiations that will lead to a legal settlement which has not been tested in court and which many of the critics feel is uh, fundamentally outside the judicial and legal framework. The judicial and legal framework so celebrated as you see, as you saw in Bert Newborn's uh, uh, understanding. Now let me uh, move now. I'm sketching out the different actors, the players, who will be acting on this stage in the subsequent two lectures, but there is one more player, highly prominent, very prominent in, in uh, much of the public interest in these matters. Let me move now to the world of art. Uh, in closing, and to say a few uh, things about the other arm of, um, of Holocaust-era restitution, uh, which also surged forward in the 1990s. There was a huge surge of litigation in order to achieve the restitution of works of art that had been stolen by uh, the Nazis during the war. Now, this is a different kind of subject, in a way, than uh, the subject I've just been referring to, because this does not involve class action lawsuits. This involves individual cases, individual claims for restitution. And the first thing to say is that each one is different. Each one is different. But I think there are some general observations that I want to make, and I want to present some uh, some of these uh, to you. The context is, I think, well known to you. It is what has been called the greatest displacement of works of art in history, or perhaps it should be said the greatest theft of works of art in history. Specifically, in the words of one uh, important investigator, man named Hector Feliciano, the Nazis' plunder of European cultural artifacts led to as many artworks being carried away by the, uh, uh, as was the case during the Thirty Years' War and the Napoleonic War combined, the Napoleonic Wars combined. Historian Jonathan Petropoulos calculated that the Germans carted off more than 600,000 pieces of art, that is, paintings, sculpture, objets d'art, tapestries, and not even including furniture, books, stamps, coins, possibly as much as one-fifth of the European art of the day, from museums, from galleries, from dealers, and from private individuals. In, in uh, France alone, for example, one-third of the fine art of France disappeared into Nazi uh, holdings. And uh, the total is said to amount to uh, more than $20, uh, 20 billion uh, dollars in today's values. Now, need I say, I think it is known to you that so much of this art was, uh, was owned by European Jews murdered during the Holocaust. Now, the litigation over art restitution, however, took the uh, courts and took the disputants into extremely complicated issues of property law, statutes of limitation, jurisdiction, issues of civil procedure. And to anticipate my general theme, when you get into each one of these cases, so frequently the issues of Holocaust history are left far, far behind as the courts 
engage these very detailed but actually very familiar issues of property law and, and who uh, is entitled to what. Who is entitled to what. Let me say, however, that in similar, uh, bearing a similarity to what I've just spoken about, the American courts are particularly receptive to claims for art restitution partly because of a requirement in common law which does not exist in the civil law systems of, uh, of Europe. The principle, a basic one, is that a thief cannot pass along good title. And so if there is a long chain of title of a work of art in which each party sold the work of art in a proper manner to the next person, but if there is one link in the chain back at the beginning having to do with theft, the entire chain uh, is held to uh, be uh, wrongly uh, conducted and uh, in such cases in the common law system at least the uh, um, purchaser at the very end of the chain, uh, uh, his or her rights are uh, disallowed or are held not to be rights at all. Now, th there are problems, I have to say, immediately with this. Yes, a thief cannot pass along good title, a, one of those principles every law student learns. But of course, as so often in the law, this is not the end of the story. Subsequent purchasers can offer defenses. They might say that the original owner waited too long to bring his or her claim, or that the original owner didn't advertise and report a loss, or any number of details which the court, on which the courts might pronounce. But basically, American law is rather sympathetic to cases made by original owners. Most frequently, in cases of restitution of art, the issue concerns an original transfer from an owner who so often is a victim of persecution or a victim of the Holocaust itself, that the original transfer was made under duress. And you will encounter this word duress over and over again if you read about Holocaust-era restitution claims. Were the original transfers of a work of art made under duress? If so, then sales, subsequent sales, could all be seen as invalid and the works deemed to be stolen. On the other side, those who are defending themselves against such suits so frequently say that the works in question, were actually sold by choice. The original owners were not operating under duress. They were sold by choice, possibly because of financial reverses, partly because this is the way collectors operate. Collectors are constantly buying and selling works, and so uh, one might argue, or one might try to produce evidence to the effect that there was not duress. Just a moment, I approach this as a historian, and historians at least often can reasonably wonder, how should one interpret duress? Well, so often in the real world, sales are a matter of a mixture of duress and choice. What if it is, I don't know, 40% duress and 60% choice, or the reverse? Uh, leading to a, 
argument that might be entirely uh, reasonable and within the, co uh, the uh, compass of the court to sort that out. But there are all kinds of questions, beginning with the obvious question of what is the proper judicial uh, venue for determining such questions. I've indicated that American courts are rather plaintiff-friendly. European courts, I think it's fair to say, are defendant-friendly. So should restitution litigation take place in Europe or America? It won't surprise you that the various uh, parties to these disputes have different views on this. What about in the United States? Because this is actually state law at issue. Should the cases take place, say, in, as in one famous instance, in New York or Illinois? This matters hugely according to the state law of New York or the law of Illinois. These choices are much more than matters of convenience, though convenience is not always so insignificant, but there are different statutes of limitation that come into play and different rules about statutes and of limitation, usually 10 years, but according to one rule, the statute of limitation does not begin to run until the plaintiff, that is the person claiming the work of art, discovers that the defendant holds the work. But then there are other jurisdictions that add that there is an additional requirement. The claimant must, demand, must discover that the work is in the hands of, a, uh, of, of uh, a defendant and must demand its return, and the possessor has to refuse that claim. And then they have 10 years before they can bring a lawsuit. I won't go into these uh, details, which... Uh, there are whole books written about this, but simply to say that once you get into this world, you enter a world of legal disputation that takes you far indeed from the kinds of accounts of persecution, murder, and survival, and, and entitlement that I think uh, most of us uh, who are not lawyers uh, uh, care about. In, especially in trying to come to a conclusion about justice, something that will take me a, a bit more time to, to, to uh, outline. Let me add some other details about the world of art restitution, because I've just scratched the surface. Crucially driving this story is that most of the works in question, the works that define the legal terrain, happen to be extremely valuable. There's a reason for that, which I'll come to in a moment. But sometimes they're worth millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars. That is the individual painting. Moreover, the art world, the international art world, works according to traditions of secrecy. Secrecy. Indeed, the art world, the international art world, the multi-million dollar international art world has been called second in scale and profitability and in some cases murkiness only to international traffic in illegal drugs. Moreover, efforts to find and recover artwork took place in sometimes overheated markets where all kinds of predators lurked, seeking to capitalize on the trading of extraordinarily valuable works of sometimes dubious provenance, where secrecy was often the rule and where intrigue was commonplace. Litigants tried and continued to try to find their way with the courts through this system. This is, need I say, extremely expensive. That is to say, and famously it was said in one case of a Degas uh, print for which there was restitution sought in courts in Illinois, it was said by one of the lawyers uh, for the defendants, uh, or sorry, for the claimants, that if the work was not worth three million dollars, it wasn't even worth trying to seek restitution through the courts. And now 
another problem. I have talked to this point about the owners. I really should talk about the heirs of owners or the successor of owners. For sadly, there are few original owners still with us to claim these works. So who are the claimants in question? The best way I can introduce you, and only that, to the problem at hand is to quote the director of the Museum of Modern Art, a former Torontonian, as it happens, named Glenn Lowry, who gave some testimony in February 1998 to a congressional uh, committee on restitution that was being sought from the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, in New York. MoMA, Glenn Lowry began, does not and will not knowingly exhibit stolen works of art. That's the end of story he would like to believe, which he said at the front end. But then he got into the problems. MoMA does not and will not knowingly exhibit stolen works of art. But research about ownership could be complicated. And now he describes his complications. Although we had assumed uh, his complications with respect to one specific claim of restitution, which MoMA was challenging in the courts, as, by the way, it is challenging on, a, on another mega dispute right now. Although we had assumed from the start the good faith of the people claiming the pictures, it now appears likely that neither family, there were two families seeking the works in question, neither family had a bona fide claim. In the case of one of these two claims, the painting was claimed by a former reporter for the New York Times, and as it turned out, her claim was based on her being the widow of a son of the pre-war owner's cousin, who in turn was not an heir to the painting. The other claim was even more convoluted. The man who asserted his family's rights in the painting wrote to us about his vivid recollections of seeing the picture in his aunt's house in Vienna before the war. But according to the pre-war owner's grandson, the claimant never even saw the painting, never set foot in the house of Vienna, and is not, as a matter of fact, an heir. A fact the claimant recently conceded in a British newspaper interview. Despite all this, the U.S. Justice Department has commenced a forfeiture proceeding to reclaim the alleged heir's painting, making it almost impossible to engage in the kind of meticulous and dispassionate research required to ascertain the exact history of this painting immediately before and after the Second World War and to decide today who is the rightful owner. Now, I mentioned this not in order to discuss the merits of this particular claim, nor in order to um, take the side of Glenn Lowry in a dispute for which there was another side. There was another side to this story. But I do want to underscore and demonstrate that the process of determining what, if any, art in American museum collections was looted by the Nazis and was not returned to their pro proper owner, the process of determining that could be exceptionally complicated and difficult. And it was the more so, I might say, when the works in question were not owned by the galleries concerned, but loaned to the galleries concerned, and that, of course, is so often the case. And then, for reasons that it's going to take me some time to discuss, these are extremely bitter disputes, bitter in the courts. Uh, one uh, authority uh, who is the director for the Art Dealers Association of America noted, I know of no lawsuit which engenders more passion this side of the bedroom than an action involving a work of art, especially one involving the possession of the work. In the end, the plaintiffs and the defendants come back to the principle of the matter. And that uh, brings me to summing up with five reflections on 
art restitution in the 1990s, and I'll, I'll try to be very, uh, very brief. The first of these, in summation, and I think you already know where I'm going. So often these disputes involve neither black nor white, but to use a term that has uh, fre frequently been applied to other aspects of Holocaust research, a gray zone, a gray zone. I'll simply put that out, and perhaps more controversially uh, now, uh, but I'll be elaborating a lot on that. But secondly, I do have to say that the story about art restitution is not, does not end with that, because the whole issue of art restitution and the litigation to seek the restitution of works that were so often genuinely stolen, uh, this litigation has resulted in progress. In a, in a new consciousness, if you like, for, and this takes me to the third observation, observation provenance. What I, provenance, which is the history of ownership. What was the history of ownership? From being a casual inquiry in times past, and one has to say casual in many cases uh, right up to the 1990s, the research into provenance has become a far more serious, determined, detailed, professional undertaking. As part of this campaign, about which I will try to judge even-handedly, there was a major consciousness raising about provenance during the course of the 1990s, and a major conference held in Washington uh, in uh, 1998 issued a, state, a uh, statement of principles that were to govern the conduct and behavior of uh, museums and other uh, dealers uh, and, uh, in, in art uh, that was possibly looted by the Nazis in order to make certain, or to do their best, I should say, uh, that, to, that justice be done. Fourthly, I want to stress, and I want you to recall the huge numbers that I referred to as I opened this section, huge numbers of works stolen, disappeared into the Nazi uh, apparatus of European-wide uh, theft. Uh, not all of the art looted by the Nazis will ever be identified or returned. And of course, complicating the matter uh, further is the whole question of Soviet, uh, the, the Soviet uh, uh, looting of uh, the parts of Europe which the Red Army uh, liberated in uh, 1944 and 1945. A, a separate question, but difficult to separate uh, in, in the minds of uh, many who look back at the big picture of, uh, of seeking justice in looted art. And finally, a thought, and with this I'm going to uh, end this lecture on which I fear I have uh, gone on for, for too long, but I, I want to uh, stress that there is uh, something of an unresolved issue here Next time, I'm going to look back at some of the history of this restitution consciousness, if you like, and how it evolved over time. With art, you know, there is a missing element in art restitution litigation, largely missing. What is that missing element? The public interest. Or at least the public interest is held by the claimants to be the full uh, restitution of art according to the legal uh, principles uh, at stake in each case. But is there not, or should there not be, other, pub, uh, other principles of public interest? Should uh, a work of art remain, let us say, in uh, the possession of a gallery 
so that the work can be seen and enjoyed by very large masses of people, or should it be awarded to someone who's, whose uh, family connection might be very distant indeed, and who will immediately sell the work, once it is successfully restituted, in order to pay the huge legal bills uh, that were uh, required in order to obtain it. Uh, well, with that uh, paradoxical question, an open question for which I don't have uh, a definitive answer, I'm going to end by thanking you all for your very close attention. Um, we have a, a few minutes for discussion. If there are questions, critiques, clarifications, uh, Michael is open to that. Yes, sir. Can ordinary legal system, American or UK, solve the material losses or life losses or suffering in Holocaust period? Or it had to be a special legal system for, for this Holocaust method. For example, like the decision of German government, I think it was fixed in a law, that the proprieties in Germany without the heirs will not belong to the German state, like ordinary law, but to something Jewish. First question. Second question is more precise. Can you what, what is your explanation that the Swiss bank settlement was made only with the Swiss private banks and the Swiss state? And Swiss Central Bank was out of this uh, settlement, despite the fact that all this was happening under the law and regulation of the government of the Central Bank. Uh, thank you for these two very important questions, um, and I'm going to. I'm going to give my brief response, but I think you've opened up a huge area. Uh, you began with a, uh, a rhetorical um, observation, if I, I re recall, about the material. Can one reach a resolution of material claims for something like the Holocaust? And my short answer is, you cannot. This is how I will begin next time. Forget about it. You can, there can ne the only thing we can do is nibble at the edges. And I think the beginning of wisdom is that most of the injustice is going to remain, because most of the people were murdered. And at the end of the day, one is kind of uh, doing the best one can, but the massive injustice will endure. But, and I'm now anticipating my own response, and it w will be at the end that I will reach this, at the end of the day, this is a political and not a legal uh, effort. I mean, to, to th the and, and this gets into the second question. The Swiss National Bank could not be sued in an American civil court because there are rules against or there are rules for sovereign immunity. You cannot sue another government in an American court. But you can sue a private bank if it has a branch in New York, you see. And so the law finds its own way forward in this, and that's what these bright lawyers are trained to do. That is to say, it looks like the law provides no avenue, but they are able to find a way. Now, 
as to their, the way that they find, well, what do I think about it? I think that it achieves some measure of justice. But it's not really justice in any consistent, principled, large-scale sense. For that, and I'm anticipating, you need a political resolution. I want to say one more thing. There is not, to my knowledge, any such resolution outside the world of reparations. And these are themselves new, relatively new, and not in the area of individual entitlement. Again here, I'm anticipating what I'm going to say next time. But when you come to reparations for the Holocaust, and one of the things I'm going to be interested in is, what did Jews at the time, that is during the war, there were a tiny handful of Jews who were thinking about reparation. And what did they think about? What else could they think about? World War I, Paris, 1919. This was the great model. But the model was between states. That's how you didn't have in 1919 a, you know, uh, an individual French person saying, I want from the German government payment for my house that was destroyed illegally by the German uh, who uh, you know, occupied part of France. No, they didn't do that at all. The French government decided what they could extract from the German government, such as it was at the time, and then the French government, through its welfare system, paid Monsieur so-and-so for the house that was destroyed. This Holocaust restitution campaign opened up for the first time to individual claimants the prospect and the opportunity to bring their cases to court. But it was a highly imperfect and incomplete system, as I think is, is obvious here. So thank you for your question. Yes, sir. How much of the 1.25 billion was actually allocated? And when you take off the legal fees, how much actually reached the people? Uh, the, I can't uh, give you the exact uh, title, uh, the exact uh, numbers, but the settlement was quite um, uh, extensive. I think about 80% of the money actually went to individuals who had dormant accounts. And let me tell you, I, I have spoken to uh, a man named Judah Griebetz, who was the special master for the court under Judge Edward Corman, who actually wrote the settlement. Now, he believes that this settlement was well, he's a, he's a great defender of it, but he makes a very strong case. Um, the settlement was, um, I would say, quite uh, extensive. And um, we're talking about uh, hundreds of millions of dollars and individuals who had dormant accounts and who could prove that they had dormant accounts did get uh, their restitution. Now, they did not get the full interest and compensation that um, some of them claimed, but they did get settlements, and most of it did go actually into the pockets of individuals and their heirs. Of course, uh, and I cannot go into this because I don't have the scholarly uh, uh, Knowledge and, and I haven't pursued this in the work that I'm that I'm uh, that I've written about because I've written about the American campaign. But some of you here doubtless know about the Israeli analog uh, having to do with the Palestinian banks, for which there was a commission of the Knesset, and about which uh, there are I know continuing grievances and discussions and so forth. Uh, but but perhaps reference to the. Israeli banks side of the story, which again I don't deal with, is a way of underscoring that this Swiss story is not unique. Uh, and that 
I believe, and one of the cases I'm going to make, is that the, er the issue of individual restitution, is some, especially through civil litigation, is something entirely new. In my own country, I might say, and in many countries around the world, we have this issue with aboriginal peoples who have their own claims, sometimes brought before courts in Canada, but also in New Zealand, in Australia, uh, and, and elsewhere. Not so much in the United States, in which individuals are making claims for wrongs done during a time of oppression and even genocide, as is their claim. Uh, yes, Matt. I wanted to ask two questions. Uh, first, uh, was it uh, why did you didn't you mention uh, Abraham Borg and the Jewish Agency uh, part in all this uh, affair? Because they were motivating uh, Eisenstadt and Amato and the, you know, they, they were all together. I even think that Bob was the one that started the thing, anyhow. The second question is, what do Professor Neubaum think about the dormant account of uh, Chase Manhattan Bank, uh, City Bank, and so on? Because it was dealt in an American uh, committee that was made specially to investigate the yes. dormant account. Yes, thank you for these two questions, uh, and my answer is briefly, I don't think either of these were so important. I mean, I realize it's like feeling the camel, and if you're Avram Burg, you might think that you are the moving force, but insofar as I stand back from the whole thing, the pressure from the Israelis was relatively minor, I believe, and the pressure from the World Jewish Congress was much more intense, much more active, much more energetic, uh, and much more uh, threatening to the Swiss banks. I might say, and this is really getting me into tender areas, <laughs> uh, I think that the Israeli profile in this period, not in the 1950s, but the Israeli profile is actually fairly low. And one reason it is low is that the whole issue of reparation for historic wrongs is not one for which the Israeli authorities are eager to see a resolution that might involve <laughs> exposure, let's say. Or, you know, uh, should, look, it's, it's difficult. It's a, a difficult issue. But I, do not, I have not seen a powerful Israeli presence here. Although Avram Borg was involved, yes, and I'm going to be talking about some of the history of this. And, and for, from the 1950s, uh, I mean, the, the great figure is, is uh, Nachum Goldman, and I'll be talking about that next time. But the Israeli profile is diminished in the 1990s, in my view. Um, this just let's make this the last But question. I find myself, uh, if you'll forgive me, often saying that, I, that I'm going to be anticipating, I'm, because I am going to take some of these up. I'm going to be going over the same ground and raising some... That's why I say make this the last question so they will be tantalized to come to the next lecture. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> sir. <laughs> okay, I'm not saying this will tantalize them, but you mentioned that the European critics of the uh, reparation process uh, one thing which irked them was that no legal uh, judgment was entered and it was all negotiated out, okay? I'm not a big legal expert in my years at college. I only took one class in law, which was the history of American legal system. One thing which struck me was how few cases get to the courts in the fact that they actually get legal, legal judgments. So was this process so different than, than the legal system, the American legal system in general, or these uh, class action suits? In particular, was there anything really different from this than what usually happens in America? Let me assure you that uh, when a company, let us say Daimler-Benz, is brought before an American court to answer for wrongs done during the Second World War, this is, this is something which is absolutely unprecedented. I mean, they were... They had lawyers in uh, the United States who were um, used to dealing with some consumer issues. I don't know if the brakes in your Mercedes didn't work 
and caused an accident. Well, they would have a lawyer ready to go to an American court perhaps to answer this. But, but, uh, but the idea that there would be uh, millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, at stake in litigation in a system for which they, which they found completely not only foreign to their own legal uh, background, but, uh, but involving uh, historic wrongs committed decades before, uh, they, they found this uh, totally mystifying. And add to this, of course, the, um, the uh, chain of, of uh, responsibility, if you like. I mean, these companies are now run, you know, these major German companies are run by sort of most off, typically, you know, Harvard trained, Harvard Business School, German executives in their 40s, uh, feeling fully at home in the American world, and suddenly they are being addressed as if they were the employers of slave laborers. They simply, in other words, did not make the connection between themselves. Remember, by the way, also that who are the companies first brought to court? Ford and General Motors. Ford that has its you know, headquarters in Dearborn, Michigan. We saw these Ford and General Motors guys b before a, a congressional committee just a few days ago flying down in their, in their uh, Gulfstream jets you know, to, uh, with their tin cups uh, seeking, uh, <laughs> seeking money from the American Congress. Well, imagine if suddenly they said, oh, and by the way, you owe us money, that is, you owe the plaintiffs money for what your branch in Germany did in the 1940s. Their first charges, their, their first response is, well, we had no connection with our German branch. This was cut. Uh, and in any event, why come to us, you know, et cetera. So uh, look, uh, these, uh, these are serious issues, but I am going to discuss uh, them further. And I thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. I do urge you to come to the later lectures because I think Michael has tantalized us not only sufficiently but also to tell your friends to hear how this issue ends. Thank you very much indeed.